collective trust is kind of an assessment of safety. It's not a moral value in itself. Um, you would, could think of trustworthiness as being a moral value, that is knowing that another has made themselves vulnerable. Do you predate on that and behave selfishly or do you not? Um, and Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm glad you're here now. Um, I thought I understood his studies to show that there wasn't a relationship between trustworthiness and oxytocin levels, but rather the relationship was between trust and oxytocin levels. And if, if I'm right about that, then it may be that trust is influenced by the biological systems. It's not itself morality, but it's sort of clearing the way for moral possibilities. Yeah, that's sort of how I think about it. That is that the social attachment and the trust that goes along with social attachment really kind of sets the stage for the kind of problem solving that we do when we're trying to make a decision about what to do in this or that circumstance. And the fact that we are very attached to this person and want them to do well and, and feel bad if they feel bad and so forth is, is, is really the, the platform. And the trust I just think of as, as the kind of other side of the coin, if, if you like. But I, I, I take your point. I, I think this is a very productive point that, that Paul raised about trust. And I think we can actually bring together uh, some of the things that several of us have said as follows. Um, you know, bird got to fly, fish got to swim, human got to live in a, in a cooperative community saturated by trust. And I think this helps explain both why the Danes come out so well and why in this country the Orthodox Jews and Evangelicals come out so well because there are many different ways to create a community of very, very high trust. The Danes managed to do it with, you know, government level institutions that work well. In America, and it's, we're not very likely to get that anytime soon, so some communities have found other ways to do it without government. So, uh, a, a thought is uh, prompted by um, uh, Jonathan Haidt's um, quoting the, the golden rule, do unto others, you have them do unto you. Uh, that great philosopher, George Bernard Shaw, pointed out that it should be, don't do unto others as you would have them do unto you because they may not like it. I mean, the implication being that, <laughs> you know, other people can be so different from you that you may not at all share their interests and desires and so on. <laughs> and, and, and what that leads to, the thought that leads to, is that our instinctual responses to others or the oxytocin-producing uh, experiences we have may sometimes require being overridden. In, in other words, that, that there's a, a place for socialization, education, reflection, and what have you, that actually runs counter to some of our instincts, especially when the instinct is to punch the other guy on the nose. Uh, so uh, that there has to be... A, a more complex and indirect story about how our behavior, especially when it's conscious and deliberate behavior, uh, takes the form that it does, which goes against the story that one might tell at the neurological level. Not, that's not to impute the, the fact that there, are, there is obviously, there has to be this uh, neurological basis for it, but that there has to be also uh, uh, an added dimension. Maybe that's something that Pat well, could comment yeah. on. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I think that's the part of the story that you invoke the reward system to describe. So, so it's learning as you grow up what kinds of things are disapproved of or approved of and what works and what you get punished for and so forth. That that's the, how the reward system is engaged, and so that when you're, you know, you finally reach the golden age of 15 or whatever it is, you have a pretty good idea of the kinds of things that are are, are going to really be damaging to your reputation, or that are going to uh, things that 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 you might where you might get away with snubbing your nose at uh, or thumbing your nose rather at authority and so forth. So I. That seems to me all part of where the reward system comes into the story. Now, I mean, I can say the reward system, and, but, but that's going to be a hugely complex story. But that's where, it's, that's where all of that is going to fit into the picture, I think. And, and, and you're, you're quoting Gary Marcus um, about genes providing a first draft. I, I, we can go into this at some other time at greater length, but even that sounds to me like too solid a product. Um, even a first draft has set a, set a lot of things in place. Um, and Rob, with that? Yeah, yeah I, 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 think, I think there's more construction going on than, than, than a first draft, but we can talk about this another time. Um, there's, there's actually one piece that, that I just want to put in here neurologically. That, George. That, that, Sorry, go ahead. That, that links Pat's and, and Jonathan's presentations, because it's not just about the reward system, because we have in the case of psychopaths essentially a, a perfect natural dissection of 
what we mean, what I mean by morality, you know, empathy and, and concerns about uh, harm and, and fairness, um, and what, what we, the, the best theory of, of the, the neurobiology of psychopathy at this moment is that it, it involves the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, but it also it, it involves many other regions so that it's, it's, it's why an injury to the brain late in life doesn't mimic real psycho developmental psychopathy. There's some, that's something called acquired sociopathy where you have similar problems, but not the full suite of, of problems of a psychopath, one of which is a, a, an, a predisposition to, to instrumental violence where your, your violence is not reactive, not driven by a, a rage you're flying into, but just a cold, calculated victimization of other, of other people to get what you want. And the, the theory that of, of how they uh, come to be this way is that there's amygdala dysfunction which, which allows them not to recognize um, uh, af negative affect in other people, especially sadness and fear. And the theory is, is, that, is that we learn uh, to, we, our, our empathy gets tuned up by this punishment signal from others. Every time we transgress others in, in a morally relevant way such that we provoke sadness and fear in them, that is the, that is the unconditioned stimulus that we are sensitive to and, and this, it, it modifies the conditioned stimulus of our, of our behavior. Um, psychopaths don't appear to have that and then they learn, they, they simply learn that it becomes useful to victimize people to get various aims. Yeah, well, it's reward well, and punishment. George Coop? Yeah, to that point, um, I, I was at Emory not too long ago and talking to Larry Young and this, there's a great deal of overlap between the reward system that attachment, um, the reward system that's the substrate for attachment and the reward system associated with addiction. But, but the converse is also true, which speaks to the last point, which is that, that um, those same systems that I talked about on the anti-reward system, the dark side of addiction, are engaged when you lose attachment. And so a loss of attachment, like the loss of a loved one or a loss of, of of, of, of a very dear friend engages the same kind of um, opponent process that you see when you when you go into drug withdrawal, and and so your point that you just made, um, Sam, is is valid there because it may be indeed that that a psychopath is that disconnect is occurring early on in life, and so it's not simply the loss of. Uh, it's not simply that their reward system didn't develop, but it may be the way their reward system reacts to uh, the loss. And, and they often suffer. I mean, we heard earlier that these individuals um, are abused, um, socially deprived, and all kinds of uh, trauma associated with early development. So it could be this kind of perturbation that sits in stage with you called it instrumental, what I have heard it called predatory uh, violence, where there is no affect associated with that is a that you know every thing I've ever read about psychopathy suggests that the violence associated with psychopathy is indeed not effectively mediated. So the whole effective system is uh, implicated in in this. Mm. We're now um, only one hour over. Um, just some sort of minor miracle, but I, I think we ought to sort of draw to a close and we can pick this up again tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you to the panel. Yeah, I really like, I like to talk. That's good.